Welcome to We the People, a Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, President of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us. While the 2020 elections are over, the battle on election reform is really just beginning. At the national level, there's HR1, a proposal to completely overhaul the country's election system. If it passes, it will transfer a very significant amount of control of how elections are run in this country from the states to the federal government. At the state level, at the same time, there are hundreds of bills making their way throughout legislatures across the country to protect and strengthen election integrity. With me to discuss the latest election reform efforts are two of the country's foremost experts on the topic, J. Christian Adams and Rick Essenberg. Christian is the president and general counsel of the Public Interest Legal Foundation and the founder of the Election Law Center. From 2005 to 2010, he served in the voting section at the United States Department of Justice. Rick Essenberg is the founder and president of the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty, commonly referred to as Will. Under his leadership, Will has grown into one of the most active and effective state-based litigation centers in the country. Welcome, Christian and Rick. Great to have you. Thanks for having us. Let's do a little table setting first by looking back at the 2020 elections, which, by the way, had the highest voter turnout of any election in American history and took place during a pandemic. What's your general assessment of last year's election? Christian, why don't we start with you? Give us an overview of what you saw throughout the country. And then, Rick, give us your thoughts on Wisconsin, which obviously was, again, a key battleground state. Christian? I, I think there are probably three things that characterize the 2020 election. One is a lot of chaos and uncertainty. Everybody knows that. They watch the news. The second thing that I think characterized it was a basic relaxing of state procedures because of COVID. The rush to mail balloting in Nevada, for example, Pennsylvania accepted ballots late. Virginia mailed, uh, allowed mail ballots to come in with no postmarks. One of the things we actually had to litigate to stop that. But all around the country, they relaxed standards. Thirdly and last, something really serious emerged, and that's private money moving into government election offices to create new ways of doing things. I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about the Center for Technology and Civic Life, but I think that's the third big thing. Rick? Yeah, I mean, I think Wisconsin was an example of much of that. Um, we didn't have ballots that were counted late, but um, that was only because uh, a federal judge who had ordered such things was uh, subsequently reversed by the higher courts. Um, but we did have um, a dramatic shift uh, to absentee balloting and an effort on the part of the local officials, um, perhaps well-intentioned, perhaps not, uh, to make that easier. And this resulted in an election that was very, very close, um, probably beyond the margin of fraud, but yet uneasy. Um, many of the things that Christian uh, mentioned happened here. Uh, there was an influx of private money, which we believe had an impact on voter turnout. Uh, there were uh, instances of clerks who were uh, perhaps well-intentioned uh, altering ballots. There were allegations of ballot harvesting. There, were, uh, there was this private money, uh, as I said before, that flowed into the system. And it left people um, with, uh, with a feeling of sort of vague uneasiness that perhaps the outcome was correct, but um, there's enough going on here um, to uh, warrant a closer look at uh, what happened here and elsewhere. Christian, let's talk about H.R. 1, which has made its way from the House of Representatives to the United States Senate. In your view, what aspects of H.R. 1 should we be most concerned about? Probably all of them. No, seriously. <laughs> the, look, first of all, the constitutional damage that it does. Uh, we decentralized our elections in this country at the founding of this country for a simple reason, Rick. And that's decentralization promotes individual liberty, which is why this issue falls squarely in the liberty uh, question of, of the center-right movement. If I had to pick three things, I'd say the worst is probably the redistricting power, the federal government basically stripping that 
away from the state, something that's utterly incomprehensible. The revival of federal micromanagement. When I was at the Justice Department, we used to micromanage the tiniest state election change, where you put a polling place, uh, what are the hours that your office is open, that sort of revival of that federal power. And I'd say the third thing is allowing uh, ballots to come in for 10 days after the election by mail. In other words, mandating that states allow mail ballots to roll in for 10 days. We need certainty in our elections, not two weeks of uncertainty, which this would mandate. Christian, can HR1 survive judicial scrutiny? If, if it passes, it will almost certainly be challenged in the courts. Well, that's a tough one. I, I was just quoted in the Washington Times this week of saying not only does HR1 rig the elections, it rigs the litigation because it is said you can only bring one case with one lawyer in one court, which is in D.C. Uh, so I think really it's, it's so massive, and we haven't even touched most of it. I think it's really time to start a genuine discussion of whether this is like a 1989 sort of moments where states respond by just saying, you know, go ahead and try and enforce this. I mean, they have stripped so much power away from the states in contravention of the original constitutional bargain that I think, uh, you know, we wouldn't have a country if not for this arrangement. The proponents are kind of the new nullifiers. They're nullifying the Constitution. So we need to have serious discussions about what the response would be that is unlike other responses in the past. Rick, in Wisconsin, almost 76% of eligible voters actually voted last November, and that was the fourth largest figure in the country. What happened? Well, I mean, I think that um, uh, it was um, a highly salient election. Uh, I think that uh, we had a, um, a run-up to this election um, in the spring um, in which we substantially moved to absentee balloting. I think absentee balloting is a thing that goes of itself. Once people do it, it becomes easier to do it again. And uh, again, I think there, were, uh, there was a lot of private money uh, that got poured into the state. Um, uh, much of it uh, designed to, to uh, facilitate the ground game of both political parties. A lot of the private money uh, facilitated democratic efforts and, uh, and, and this spiked turnout. Uh, it, um, it spiked turnout in a way that uh, uh, I think benefited both political parties. As I said, it was very, very close, about 20,000 vote difference uh, in the presidential election over 3 million votes cast. And uh, I think that um, uh, as we go forward, uh, we can expect to see um, continued use of absentee balloting. And at, because absentee balloting is a thing that happens outside the supervision of election officials, it's very, very important to have a set of rules in place um, that not only um, objectively prevents um, fraud, but subjectively provides the electorate with confidence in the outcome. So that when we uh, when we have these bitterly contested elections, and as is, will always be the case, as a winner and a loser, we all we can all accept the outcome. Let's drill down a little bit on the presence of outside money. You've both talked about that, and specifically the Center for Tech and Civic Life, which contributed millions of dollars in grants to targeted Wisconsin municipalities for so-called election administration. Uh, we know that this group was heavily funded by Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg. Rick, uh, do you think it had an impact on election results? And do you think this type of funding should be legal? Well, we took a preliminary look at what, we, uh, uh, what impact this may have had on election turnout. And we found that um, there was a correlation um, between the expenditures of CTCL money and democratic turnout. So we believe yeah. that Democratic turnout was um, increased, uh, we estimate, by about 10,000 votes across the state. Wouldn't been enough to change the outcome of the presidential election, but would have uh, cut that margin in half. Uh, there, there are a couple of problems with CTCL money. Um, um, first of all, if you, if you drill down, much of it um, is being used to run what is effectively a ground game. Yeah. And typically we require political actors to spend that money subject to the disclosure uh, requirements that, um, that, that pertain uh, to the expenditure of money for that purposes. Secondly, you have private actors coming in and assuming a public responsibility of some very serious allegations in Green Bay about the extent to which these private actors 
uh, assumed public responsibility and exercised some degree of authority over the way that the votes have recounted. And finally, and this is something that we um, are still in the process of taking a, a look at, although these funds were uh, claimed to have been distributed widely uh, and on a nonpartisan basis, it's not clear that that's the case. And if in fact, we have private money that is being used uh, to, uh, to run a ground game, uh, to uh, uh, counterman public responsibilities, and then it's absolutely essential um, that it be done on a nonpartisan basis. My own view is this is the type of thing that um, we simply shouldn't have, that, that uh, we have our public officials running elections for a reason, and they should be doing it with public money. Something we need to take a hard look at. Uh, final question for both of you. Let's talk about future efforts in this on this election front. Christian, let's start with you. What what are your plans for the Public Interest Legal Foundation in 2021 on into 2022 before the next election? Right. Uh, we, what we're doing is we have a database that we employed that can tell us, you know, how many dead people voted, duplicate votes. We found seven people, for example. Or I'm sorry, one person registered seven times in in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, when you go to vote by mail, that causes a problem. So we're going to be updating the database. Uh, it's nationwide. The other thing we're doing is looking at some of the other structural issues. We filed a lawsuit against the Howard County, Maryland school board this week because they're allowing children to vote as young as sixth grade for a student child school board member that always seems to be casting the deciding vote on a variety of issues. And, and really, for example, child voting is part of the structural changes that the left wants. We're going to be looking closely at issues like that. So the data, the structure, and basically uh, response. I mean, you can wait till the Justice Department gets wound up uh, and, and you know, takes off with their campaign that's coming soon to undermine election integrity. We'll be watching that closely. And Rick, I know Will has started working on an election integrity project right here in Wisconsin. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, as you mentioned earlier, Rick, Wisconsin um, is a battleground state. Um, the election outcome was very, very close. And all of these issues that um, arose um, across the country happened here. And what we've decided to do is take a very, very close look at what happened in a single state. Um, we're going to look at um, whether there were anomalies in the pattern of voting. We're going to be looking whether uh, at what effect failure to properly maintain the voting rolls might have had on the election. We're going to take a deeper look at the behavior of uh, county clerks and in particular um, their association um, with private parties. And our hope is to identify um, what was a problem and what wasn't a problem as we moved to um, a larger degree of absentee balloting. And we think that that's important. We have no preconceptions as to how this is going to come out. And if we find that there are some things that um, you know, people associated with the conservative movement thought was a problem in the past and turned out it wasn't a problem, we'll say that. If there are things that we find were a problem, then we will attempt to come up with uh, proposals for reform that can be adopted both here in Wisconsin and elsewhere, where I think there are many of the same problems, so that um, in the future, we can not only minimize the potential for fraud, but also um, restore confidence in the election outcome so that we don't have this thing where we constantly have people claiming that uh, John Kerry or Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump uh, really won the election and, uh, and there's no acceptance of what the outcome was as we move forward. Well, Christian and Rick, thanks so much for spending some time with us and thanks very much for your very, very important work on this incredibly important and vital topic uh, for our country. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode of We the People.